Hey everyone, welcome back to the dining room shop. Quick little blurb today uh, on kinematic couplings as they came up uh, in this project I was doing here. So I wanted to a way to mount a ball to the face of my spindle here, uh, and it needs to be reasonably repeatable, and I wanted a way to, to index it uh, in increments of 180 degrees, nothing too fine, uh, but most importantly, uh, I needed it to be stable, uh, and it was probably going to be 3D printed. So these things are an oxymoron, uh, and all these criteria together led me to uh, thinking, okay, what's a way I can uh, mount it with exact constraint, exact kinematic constraint, uh, as that's probably going to be the best bet for stability. And so we go to kinematic couplings. The reflex for something like this might be, okay, you know, let's uh, print a Maxwell coupling. And you've probably seen this before. This is sort of what people, I would say most people think when they think of a kinematic coupling. Three balls, in this uh, old model I made some years ago, it's a 3D printed model, the balls are actually printed. It's quite crappy. Uh, but three balls, three Vs, evenly spaced 120 degrees apart, exact kinematic constraint. You know, constraints, two degrees of freedom here, two here, and two here. So that's an option. You know, 3D print something that bolts to the face of the spindle, maybe glue in some hardened uh, contact faces for the balls to, to register against. Uh, but what that doesn't get me is 180 degree indexing, and it's also just adding a lot of 3D printed material, which is subject to bolting stresses and may creep over time, this sort of thing. I just wasn't a huge fan of it. Um, I noted that there's already holes on here, how can we use this for indexing? Uh, you know, the indexing doesn't need to be exceedingly accurate. We're not talking arc seconds. I just need a reasonably, reasonably good 180 degree flip. Uh, and so it led me to uh, sort of rediscover the joy of uh, flexural kinematic couplings. And what do I mean by this? So with a standard Maxwell coupling, such as this, uh, the degrees of freedom um, are constrained by uh, a ball in contact with a surface, right? The degree of freedom constrained is the direction normal to that surface at the point of contact. And the uh, degrees of freedom remaining are allowed by the ball sliding on that surface or rolling slash pivoting. If it's a rolling and the ball's fixed, it's really more of a stationary sliding like that, right? And uh, that's one way of doing this. Now for uh, really high repeatability couplings uh, or things where you need a high degree of uh, decoupling of stress between the two, uh, the two uh, things going together, uh, this can be a problem uh, because inherently, because it's a ball on a plane contact, there is some friction, right? So let's say, for example, uh, we have something we're mounting to the base here and they have vastly different CTEs there's going to be large temperature swings in operation, uh, but we don't want any stress to be imparted on the, let's say, optic that we've mounted uh, to the top here. Kinematic couplings are good for this, but if you used a traditional Maxwell coupling like this and the bottom were to expand a lot, uh, in theory, if there was no friction on the contact interfaces, this would be fine. The, the Vs would expand, but that wouldn't translate the location of this at all and it wouldn't bend it. Because there's friction, what happens is until the force is high enough to where it can overcome the static friction of the contact, it will try and sort of pull on that ball uh, laterally and pull those three balls outwards. And it can actually transmit stress uh, through the coupling interface. But what if we replace the degrees of freedom awarded by you know sliding a ball on a plane with a flexural degree of freedom with no static friction? So that's the idea behind a flexural kinematic coupling. And so here we have a Maxwell coupling equivalent uh, done with flexures instead of balls and, and Vs. So what we have here is three balls, but they're mounted on these little flexure uh, stages here, 
which are actually over-constrained and as such they don't have a uh, very long travel but for short movements they're quite quite flexible like this they're they're floppy and importantly they only have one degree of freedom right they can only translate in this direction like this so we make a bit of a trade-off in the traditional Maxwell coupling each of the contact points constrains two degrees of freedom. And that's sort of the criteria here. We have three contact points. We need each to constrain two uh, for a total of six. The Maxwell coupling uh, has a V, so the two contact points constrain uh, two degrees of freedom there, and we're done. No more. The thing is, with this, these sit in holes on the spindle face. And a ball in a hole, or practically a ball in a cone, or most kinematically a ball in a trihedral contact, an inverted pyramid, right? That constrains three, so that's too many. So we add one back with the flexural degree of freedom here. And so this is a this ball seated in a cone, or some sort of conical seat like this, is kinematically equivalent to a ball sliding in a V. Uh, they're the same as far as the degrees of freedom that they constrain. But what that allows us to do is instead of having a mating piece with three Vs, we can have a mating piece with three holes, three cones. And so that's what we do here. This just plops down into the, uh, the holes on the, the nose of the spindle there. And it's actually quite incredible and extremely satisfying, you know, looking at how floppy these are. This, is, this really seems like you can never make a rigid connection with this, with how loose these are. But then you put it down on there and just, you know, it, it sits there, but it's absolutely locked up. Those are rock solid now. This does not want to move at all. There's no detectable flex. And it, it, it just is exactly constrained, right? That's the whole point. So it's important to note that this allows me to index, but the kinematic coupling aspect of it, the fact that it's exactly constrained, it has nothing, that has no bearing on the accuracy of the indexing. Uh, the indexing is just as good as these holes are drilled, which may not be, you know, crazy good, but it's good enough for what I'm doing here. The kinematic coupling feature just allows me to be exactly constrained no matter which set of holes I'm in. If the you know, relative position of the three holes that I'm putting this into is slightly different between two different mounting positions, this doesn't care. The flexures allow it to self-align and still be exactly constrained no matter which set of holes I go with, as long as they're within the travel range of the flexures here. Uh, but it, that doesn't, you know, add any accuracy to the indexing. That's still defined by the, uh, the holes. So I really love this concept. And in fact, it's not actually uh, taken to its fullest extent uh, in this application here. I, I like what we've done here, but if you think about it, we got rid of one of those those friction sources, right? The uh, the ball sliding in the V is now replaced with a flexural uh, bearing, so that's good. But we still have more uh, frictional sources in theory, which is the ball sort of rolling slash pivoting in the, uh, the conical seat. And, you know, you can actually take this to its fullest extent and this over here, this design is the, you may have seen it before, the flexure bipod mount. That is this taken to the max and every degree of freedom, uh, it's kinematically identical to a Maxwell coupling, except that it's all flexural. The motion, the linear motion in the V is flexural and all of the rotary degrees of freedom that the ball has by pivoting here are all replaced by uh, degrees of freedom uh, afforded by flexures. Uh, so this is for like really high precision optics stuff. And I used to have a 3D printed model, one of those, uh, just like this one, but it's broken. I need to make a new one, so. So just for fun, we'll still do a repeatability test. Got the spindle sitting on the table here and the indicator looking at the ball. I'll uh, lock the focus on the indicator back there, which is, uh, reasonably well zeroed. I'm just going to pick this up and put it back down a couple times. I'm going to try and minimize the amount of time I'm holding it to minimize the heat input. Uh, 
but as long as I grab it at three points and heat it symmetrically, in theory, hopefully, uh, there shouldn't be any much of any drift, but we'll, we'll see what happens here. So I'll pick it up, put it back down, give it a bit of seating force. Okay, not too bad. Do that a couple more times. Pick it up, put it back down, seat. Ooh, that's not good. Up, down, seat. That's better. Up, down, seat. Okay, one more time. Not too bad. So besides that one, that one uh, fluke there, it's it's good within you know maybe a micron or so. And you know for a 3D printed kinematic coupling, that's uh, pretty much as good as I would expect. And again, it doesn't really uh, need to be uh, much of anything else. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, it's I guess it's worth noting that some of the lack of repeatability might be due to the fact that the kinematic interface isn't ideal between the balls and the holes. You know, this is a hole after all. Uh, it might not be perfectly round. We don't know where it's contacting. It's a little bit over constrained in that regard. Like I said, in the ideal sense, like in a Kelvin clamp or a Kelvin coupling, you'd have a trihedral uh, interface where each ball contacts on three points. But this isn't exactly as ideal as that. Uh, but yeah, anyways, this is uh, good enough for what I'm doing here. And I just really like the, uh, oops, this, uh, the concept. So thought I'd share it. Hope someone uh, finds that interesting. Thanks for watching.